So we've been talking a lot about synchronous circuits lately, which means that parts of our uh, logic circuits are going to be synchronized, they're going to line up over time. Um, and since we've been talking about that, we now should spend some time talking about some issues that can occur during the synchronization process, some timing issues that can occur with our logic components. Um, so the most important timing issue to be aware of is the concept of delay within our uh, circuits, within our components. Um, here we see a very <clears throat> simple circuit. It's just an inverter, basically, right? But we can see that when X changes, from, in this case, from low to high, and then back from high to low, that the output value Y actually does not change instantaneously. There is some amount of delay before we can actually detect that change of X, before it actually makes its way through the inverter to the output and is reflected in Y. And that happens in both directions, right? Both when we're going from high to low, and then again when we're going from low to high. So this is what's known as delay within our circuits. And it's caused by capacitance that exists. So there is capacitance everywhere, across every component in a particular circuit. You might hear it called parasitic capacitance. Um, the main source of capacitance in our circuits is going to be the transistors themselves. So, you know, that's part of the reason why we spent some time a couple weeks ago talking about how to use the fewest possible transistors uh, in our circuit. Um, so, the reason that this delay exists is because of this parasitic capacitance, and it's actually caused by having to charge up this capacitor or discharge this capacitor. Um, that takes time. It does not happen right away. And so we can see that any changes to my input are going to take a little bit of time before they are actually reflected in the output. So now that we understand that we have this delay and we understand why this delay exists, how does this affect the design of our digital circuits? Well, let's take a look at a D flip-flop. So we've been talking a lot about flip-flops lately. Uh, we use flip-flops to synchronize our circuits, that is their primary purpose, to store and remember things as well as synchronization. And so this fact that we have delay uh, requires us to consider two important times as in regards to this flip-flop. We have a setup time and a hold time. <clears throat> so the setup time is, is the amount of time prior to the rising edge of the clock that the input signal must remain stable in order for it to be read in appropriately. So if the input signal changes during this setup time, during this period of time before the rising edge of the clock, we run the risk of having metastability in our flip-flop, which is a bad thing. Hold time is the amount of time after the rising edge of the clock that our input signal must remain stable in order for it to be read in appropriately. And again, we have the same issue. If the input signal were to change during this hold time period, we run the risk of metastability within our circuit, which is not desirable. To understand why setup time and hold time exists, consider what a D flip-flop actually looks like on the inside. So here we see our D flip-flop D flip diagram that we saw a few videos back. And we can see that it's actually just two D latches connected together, right? Just two D latches connected in series. So if we think about this idea of setup time, what does that actually mean? Well, consider that prior to the rising edge of the clock, right, D is going to change, but it's going to take some time for D to change in this D latch, for D to propagate through this D latch, right? It doesn't happen right away. It's going to take a little bit of delay for that signal to make it through the D latch. So this idea of setup time, right, is based around how long is it going to take that D signal then to propagate through that first D latch in order to be successfully read by the second D latch. So that is why setup time exists. Hold time is based on this fact of the enable bit, actually. So once the clock goes from low to high, this D latch is going to become disabled. Right? It's going to remain uh, constant. It's going to stay constant. But again, this clock signal is going to take a little bit of time to propagate through this D latch before everything gets frozen into place. So the hold time is how long does it take for this clock signal to actually freeze this D latch so that it cannot change its value. If the input value changes in the meantime, then we don't really know what we're going to get um, in terms of output. So those are the two uh, important pieces in terms of setting a flip-flop, we have another important time characteristic of our flip-flops, which is propagation delay. 
So propagation delay is described as how long does it take if the input changes for me to see a, a change in the output, or more specifically, how long after the rising edge of the clock can I expect to see a change in the output of my D flip flop? And to understand where propagation delay comes from, consider that once the rising edge of the clock happens, it's going to take time for this second D latch to read in this value from the first D latch and propagate that information through to the output. So that time is called the propagation delay. And you'll act, often see it uh, specified as two different values, the minimum propagation delay and the maximum propagation delay. It'll actually uh, depend on whether we're going from low to high or high to low. It actually works a little bit faster or slower depending on what kinds of transistors are in use uh, in the configuration of the, of the flip-flop in general. So now that we have an idea of what setup time is, what hold time is, and what propagation delay are, it's good to talk about what the implications of these are on our circuits as we're designing them. Uh, the first thing to pay attention to is how, how fast can we make our clock cycle? So we really want to make our clock cycle as fast as possible, right? But there's a limit. We can't just run it arbitrarily fast because we have delays in effect and we need to allow uh, time for our signals to propagate through our circuits um, so that we don't violate our setup time and our hold time constraints. So the clock signal is actually really dictated by the setup time primarily. We can see here that the um, absolute smallest value for the period is based on the uh, propagation delay from our flip-flop, as well as any combinational circuit delay that might exist between one flip-flop and the next, and then the setup time of, that, of this particular flip-flop. Uh, how this actually works in a uh, typical logic circuit is I will find the largest possible value. I will find the combinational circuit path that includes the most gates in between uh, one flip-flop and another flip-flop. Or it might even be one flip-flop and itself if it loops back around, right? Uh, but regardless, I will find the largest combinational circuit path. That's called the critical path. And I will use that to determine my clock cycle. So if we want to write this out as an equation, we can see that the period of my clock right, must be greater than the largest flip-flop propagation delay plus the largest combinational circuit delay that can exist from our critical path plus the setup time. And then, in addition, we need to add in this factor called clock skew. So what clock skew is, is this idea that my clock is coming here from the left, right? Well, this flip-flop is physically closer to the clock than this flip-flop. So the clock signal is actually going to arrive here a little bit later than it will arrive at this particular flip-flop. It might not be very by very much, right? It might be by a very small amount. Uh, but the clock signal will arrive here a little bit later than it arrives at this first flip-flop. So again, just to reiterate, we need to find the critical path of our circuit. That is the path that has the most stuff in the way, the longest uh, path in between flip-flops, in between two flip-flops, right? We need to take the flip-flop propagation delay into account. We need to take uh, the critical path delay into account, the setup time into account, and the clock skew into account. And we can use that to determine our clock period. All of this is simply to ensure that if the output of this flip-flop changes, that signal will make it to this second flip-flop, right, before the setup time is due to begin, right, because that's what needs to happen. Once that setup time begins, I can no longer change the input. So if the signal arrives after the setup time has already begun, that can cause metastability in my circuit. So that's how we can analyze our circuits uh, as it relates to setup time. Now let's think about the effects of hold time, right? So hold time is how long do I have to hold my signal constant <clears throat> after, after the uh, rising edge of the clock. And so again, we can see that hold time must be less than the amount of propagation delay as well as the amount of circuit, uh, combinational circuit delay um, in our uh, smallest path in this particular case, in the smallest possible path. So think about what we're trying to do in this particular case if this signal changes, I don't want it to get to this flip-flop too fast because that would be a violation of the hold time. This input to this second flip-flop must remain constant for the entire hold time. So if this signal traverses this combinational circuit path too quickly,
then I will not be able to uh, ensure that that hold time constraint is met. So if we want to put this into an equation, we see that the hold time must be less than the minimum <clears throat> propagation delay from the flip-flop plus the minimum combinational circuit delay minus the maximum clock skew. So clock skew works against us in this particular case, actually. Right. Okay, so the final thing to talk about in regards to timing are the inputs, the timing of our inputs. Um, everything that we saw in the previous sets of slides was from one flip-flop to another, right? But we also need to talk about how our inputs affect our flip-flops as well. You see, in this particular case, I have an input called X that has a, you know, a path with a few gates in the way as well as a path with really no gates in the way at all. And I need to you know, be able to determine when this, this input can actually change because it needs to uh, ensure the setup and hold times for both of these flip-flops in this particular circuit. And that's going to be uh, different because of the amount of uh, delay caused by these combinational components, right? These logic gates in this path that don't exist in this path. So the stable period is the amount of time when these, this input has to remain stable. There is a certain amount of time where I cannot change this input Otherwise, I run the risk of violating the setup or hold constraints of one or the other of these flip-flops. That stable period is going to start at the rising edge of the clock minus the setup time plus the maximum amount of delay, right? So I'm worried about violating the setup time of this particular flip-flop since it's going to take a little bit, uh, since it's going to take a long time for that signal to get there. So X must remain stable at the time period of the rising edge of the clock minus the setup time plus the maximum delay. And it must remain stable until the rising edge of the clock plus the hold time minus the minimum amount of delay. So after that rising edge of the clock has taken place, I run the risk of violating the hold time of this particular flip-flop. I cannot change X right, until after that hold time has passed. So I need to take both flip-flops into account and try to hold X stable over that period of time. Now, sometimes we run into trouble with our input signals that we don't always know when they're gonna happen. If we're taking user input, for example, imagine somebody typing on a keyboard or clicking a mouse. We don't know when that input's going to happen. We have no idea when that input's actually going to happen. So how can we possibly keep it stable over a certain period of time or restrict it to certain periods of time as it relates to the clock cycle? We really can't, at least not without a little bit of help. Um, so in order to help us with this particular problem, we have what's called a synchronizer, which tries to stabilize an asynchronous output using a, only a single clock cycle. So we, we do have to pay a price. We have to pay a price of one clock cycle. But the gain that we get out of that is a potentially stable signal. So here is my asynchronous input, right? You can see that I'm feeding it directly into a flip-flop. There's nothing in between. So there is some potential chance right, that this asynchronous input is going to change during the setup time or the hold time, which would cause metastability. So we see here at, at the beginning, at the, uh, at the output, in the middle, rather, that this signal could be potentially uh, metastable at this particular point. But I'm going to insert a second flip-flop at this point, right? which is going to serve to stabilize this, metastab this metastable signal, right? Metastability typically will resolve itself um, in a short period of time, usually in a, in a period of time less than a particular clock cycle. So while we don't like metastability, it does resolve itself rather quickly. And so we can, we can assume that this metastable signal will resolve itself in a clock cycle or less in most cases. That's, it won't always, that assumption won't always be true, but we can make that assumption. And if we do make that assumption, then we know for a fact that once it makes it through this second flip-flop, that signal is going to be safe. It's no longer going to be metastable anymore. Right? So this idea of two flip-flops in, in sequence uh, to buffer this asynchronous input is what we call a synchronizer it allows us to ensure that our asynchronous input is going to be stable uh, with a relatively high degree of, um, of accuracy. So we cannot guarantee that this signal is going to be uh, safe. We cannot guarantee that this will not be a metastabil metastability issue. 
So you see over here it says probably safe. Um, but if you do the math and you crunch the numbers statistically, it's a very, very low probability that it's going to cause a, a problem uh, because of this uh, synchronizer that is trying to buffer our asynchronous signal. So to kind of wrap things up, if you design a digital logic circuit, you need to analyze the timing values for that partic particular logic circuit. Here's what you should take a look at. Here are the four things that you should examine. Um, you need to check for hold time violations. right? So for every flip-flop to flip-flop path, you need to check this equation and make sure that it's true. This is just a slightly rewritten version of the equation that we saw on the previous slide. Right? Not exactly the same, but almost identical to the equation that we saw on the previous slide. Then we need to determine the minimum clock period that can exist within our circuit. Again, we're going to find the path between two flip-flops with the largest value of this particular equation. You see it's a function of the propagation delay, the combinational circuit delay, the setup time, and the clock skew. Again, this is called our critical path. The largest possible path between two flip-flops is called our critical path, and that determines the minimum clock period. You then should Analyze input timings for all of your inputs. So determine between which two times your inputs must be stable. That's going to have an effect on how you test your circuit, how you uh, run your circuit um, when you actually deploy it on FPGA or build a chip, uh, for example. So we need to know when our inputs must be stable, which is done by this equation here. You see it's a function of the clock edge, uh, the um, the the delay to uh, the flip-flop, the setup time, the hold time, and again, the uh, delay to flip-flops. And then finally, right, we need to take a look at uh, synchronous outputs. We actually didn't talk about this yet, but now is a good time. So we want to know when our outputs are going to potentially change, right? We know that our outputs can change at any point from the clock edge to the minimum output delay, which is a function of propagation delay and any combinational logic that exists, and then the clock edge to the maximum output delay, which again is a function of propagation delay and logic gates that exist. The reason that we want to analyze this is because oftentimes I'm going to be connecting circuits together. I'm going to be using them as components to one another, and so I'll need to make sure that the inputs from, or that the outputs from one circuit agree with the input timings for the next circuit. I'll need to actually match those up and make sure that they agree with one another so that I don't violate the timing constraints of either circuit. So this wraps up our discussion on timing. I know I've given you a lot of information in this particular video. Uh, please go back and rewatch the parts that were confusing to you uh, and let me know if you have any questions.